Welcome to the RightsCon studio, and I'm Melissa Chan. We're in conversation the next 30 minutes with Lama Alarayman. Lama Alarayman is the co-founder and vice president of Ignition Kuwait, a youth-run nonprofit that aims to create Kuwait's first ever space program. She is the former national point of contact for Kuwait at the Space Generation Advisory Council with a seat at the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and she hopes to promote the voice of Kuwaiti youth to the global space community. Now, Victoria Heath will be guiding this conversation, and she's a digital storyteller, researcher, and member of the Space Generation Advisory Council. They'll be discussing the participation of emerging seafaring spacefaring, not seafaring, nations in the new space race, and their decolonized visions for the future of space exploration. Victoria, over to you. Thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, uh, especially on the last day of RightsCon. This is probably my third RightsCon I've attended, so it's been such an honor um, to talk about space today. And I'm excited to be here with Lema, uh, who I actually first met in Dubai at the, the this past October uh, during the Space Generation Congress. Um, so, so excited to be here. And um, before we begin, I just want to remind the audience that as we're talking, please send in questions. There will be some time at the end for us to answer them. So Lemma, we have such little time, so I want to give you some space, no pun intended, uh, to talk a little bit about Ignition Kuwait and how it fits in, your mission fits in with Kuwait's growing space ambitions. Thank you, Victoria. So yeah, Ignition is a youth-led space research and exploration startup, and it's currently the only licensed space company in Kuwait. Uh, as an actor in the private sector, we aim to involve the country in international space efforts and hopefully motivate the government to start taking the first steps towards making Kuwait a spacefaring nation. Uh, Ignition is currently uh, aspiring to build and develop and operate an analog Martian habitat that utilizes Kuwait's unique environment. Awesome. Um, and this actually jumps into my next question nicely, talking about habitation. Um, so when we talk about the decoloni decolonization of space, two things come to my mind. And the first is something Dr. Linda Billings said, who's from the Planetary Society. And she said that in order to decolonize space, we need to change not only our practices, but our rhetoric around space. And we need to move more slowly, carefully, and thoughtfully. Um, and also Dr. Claire Nelson, who just this week during a past session, she sort of expressed her fear that we're creating a new space faring future that brings in the old economies of the past, which includes growth at all costs and has proven detrimental to Earth. So with these ideas and these fears in mind, can you talk a little bit about what decolonization of space means to you? Um, it's all about deconstructing colonial ideologies that we carried from our past and could possibly make their way into our future in space, uh, specifically the moon, when, which is the destination to build settlements for more spacefaring nations. We simply cannot have a moon with posts that declare that uh, country X or company Y owns this region uh, on the lunar surface. Um, with the Artemis missions being our next big endeavor and a number of countries joining the US to go back and settle on the moon, um, as well as the Russia and China agreement to set a lunar base by the 2030s, we are closer than ever to the new age of colonialism and the moon will be our first target. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I think France actually is the most recent um, country to join the Artemis Accords just this week. Um, and like you said, there's a number of private companies uh, with missions to the moon in just the next couple of years. And most of these companies are backed by the US, China and European nations. And most of their goals are to uh, have resource extraction, lunar mining, building a sustainable presence. And all of this, in my mind, makes it all the more urgent that we sort of move from this theoretical conversation around decolonization and actually move towards more of an action-oriented conversation, which is starting to happen and pick up some speed. So I'm just wondering, in your opinion, what do you think is the most pressing challenge here right now? 
So space is a strategic and competitive domain um, where big space powers thrive against one another. So we must defend the freedom to operate in space and ban the use of weaponry. Um, and when it comes to the moon, the most pressing challenge is colonization. Uh, if we do not take action now, I think that it would be inevitable. Um, we know that most space-faring nations are planning to have a presence on the moon within the next decade. And the most likely region where humans will be settling is the South Pole, specifically the Shackleton Crater, where ice water can be found. Mm -hmm. And if all nations target the same region, then that would be a challenge. That's a yeah, that's a very interesting point because I think most of the missions um, funded by NASA, the CLIPS missions, uh, which is the commercial partners helping build lunar landers, are targeting the, the southern region of the moon, specifically because of the availability of lunar ice. Um, before we sort of move on to talking about maybe the Outer Space Treaty, could you just explain a little bit more why that lunar ice is so important? Yeah, so basically, if we are planning to have a settlement where astronauts could be um, settling on the moon for uh, months, let's say we do need water in order to do our research to make sure that you know even the settlements are being built in the proper way we need the ice water uh, it is the most essential uh, element that we have on the moon that's why you you don't see that other uh, space companies aim or strive to go to any other part of the of the moon it's only the south pole um ice water is important uh and yeah, that, that's it. So let's go back to talk a little bit about how do we prevent any one country or handful of countries or even mostly companies as well, um, sort of dominate this new era of space. And as we saw with the last uh, big era of space exploration, we did get the Outer Space Treaty in 1967 that essentially stated the exploration and use of space shall be carried out in the interest of all countries. Outer space is the province of all mankind, which today we would say humankind. Um, but so I'm wondering, how do we update that space treaty to fit this new age? And is there any significant movement going on in that area? Yeah, so the, yeah, the Arthur Space uh, Treaty was very effective and it regulated space activity during the early stages of space exploration and still is to this very day. Um, but we do need to reshape space policies in order to meet uh, global trends and the dramatic increase of space ventures over the past decade, especially policies that prevent armed space race um, in this new age of colonialism and we will have lunar presence within the next few years, which calls for an action plan to prevent a colonization of the moon. And we do need to govern the Shackleton crater, just like we mentioned previously. Yeah. And as someone who is coming from Kuwait, uh, which is very sort of a baby in, <laughs> in the space race, what are, should countries like Kuwait be pushing for? Are they already getting into the conversation um, in like COPOIS, for example, at the UN? Or do you think they need to be more active in the conversation? Uh, countries like Kuwait, you know, just this year, Kuwait joined the UN COPOIS. And uh, mm -hmm. we do not have any step towards having a presence on the moon nor in space yet. That, that would take probably 30 years to even start there. But um, I do believe that we need to participate in the UN Legal Subcommittee and the UN Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space uh, just to be able to uh, share our opinions on uh, space policies in general and, and have a vote on everything that happens there. Um, we just started our, uh, our baby steps, just like you mentioned, in, in, in that sector. But uh, yeah, there there are some aims to just uh, enlighten people on uh, the policy, space policies and space law. And we hope to do so throughout our seat that is now a permanent in the UN COPOS. Are there specific barriers that emerging spacefaring nations have when it comes to doing more missions and getting more involved with um, space exploration today? 
Uh, definitely. I mean, for, for Kuwait, it is uh, education. Uh, education when it comes to space and astronomy is not available for everyone. It's not even available in universities here, nor can we get scholarships to study them abroad. So it is a challenge for people to become involved, and it is even more challenging to be uh, specialized for individuals or space enthusiasts to be specialized in, uh, let's say, space law or medicine or uh, architecture, or, you know. Um, so the, uh, the challenge when it comes to Kuwait is the awareness and knowledge, even um, the government does, still does not take space seriously, so that's the most challenging thing when it comes to Kuwait, but um, there is a, a, a tiny space race that's going around in uh, uh, the Gulf countries, and hopefully Kuwait was is going to participate in that. We know that Saudi Arabia are having their uh, first steps towards going even to the moon. And um, uh, the UAE already just sent a probe to, to Mars. And yeah, these are these are neighboring countries and Kuwait will eventually hop in and join the space race. And yeah. And how important do you think that is for the decolonization of space? Um, are we almost, I worry that we're we're already swaying too far towards repeating what we've done on Earth and space because a lot of the activities that are happening in space today and have been happening for decades have been dominated by the US, China, Russia, and a handful of European countries. Um, and I know with certain legal restrictions uh, in the US, for example, US companies can't really hire engineers that aren't American or don't have green cards. So there is sort of a shutdown of the talent there. So what, how important is it that we get emerging spacefaring nations into space exploration now, and also that we encourage uh, local populations to study space and to study space law? Uh, involving emerging space countries will definitely um, uh, tune down the dominance of traditional space players and it will bring back the power balance, I guess. Um, it will help when it comes to, it will encourage infrastructure, the industry, the econo economic growth, um, many in many ways and shapes and forms do emerg emerging space countries help the space race. And uh, again, we do not want to repeat the mistakes that we've done in the previous uh, space race. Uh, the best way to do it is to involve smaller countries and just share uh, their innovation and um, um, their different techniques. For, for example, we know in Kuwait, we have the drilling technique, which is not something very, very uh, um, familiar in the space sector. So we know that as an emerging space country or hopefully an emerging space country in the future, we will be able to um, uh, just share the knowledge that we have when it comes to drilling. Um, this sort of leads me to the next question that we wanted to touch on, and that was around the benefits and the drawbacks of space exploration. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who ask, why are we spending money going to space? Um, and obviously the quote unquote billionaire space race has not helped with this narrative. So I'd love for you to talk a bit about, um, and Dr. Danielle Wood from Space Enabled at MIT has done a lot of discussion around the benefits of space exploration and space science, specifically for the UN sustainability develop, Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm curious from your perspective, what SDGs do you think space is vital towards achieving? Yeah, so satellite data services are crucial, especially to people in remote areas where they're, they're limited access to affordable and clean energy and food. Um, data on hydrosphere, the biosphere, the atmosphere collected from satellites is now being used for scientific analysis and modeling to understand food systems. Um, we have Earth observation satellites that we can extract weather reports from and measure pollution um, that will help us understand life on land and below water, which is providing tangible evidence that we need uh, climate action as soon as possible. Uh, another SDG that I have in mind is good health and well-being. Uh, it is uh, space is vital in achieving that because we know that many experiments are being conducted on the International Space Station uh, by astronauts that will help us understand the human body and would advance medicine. Yeah. 
And are there any space technologies that people in the RightsCon community, so a lot of people in this community are, um, of course, worried about surveillance and digital rights and privacy and things like that. So are there any technologies that come in your mind that people in this community should actually be following and paying attention to? Uh, I definitely uh, think that mega constellations uh, are interesting and satellite internet access um, with the rise of mega constellations like SpaceX's Starlink, um, OneWeb, Amazon, we know that internet will be provided even to the most isolated regions on Earth. Uh, satellite internet is going to be very fast, especially if we're planning to put 42,000 in low Earth orbit. However, there are some issues with this technology, which we know that uh, is space debris. Uh, but we are trying to find solutions for that. But yeah, in general, I think mega constellations are interesting, and I definitely encourage folks at RightsCon to read more about them. Yeah, could you actually talk a bit more about, I think you just recently mentioned space debris, and that is a significant issue. <laughs> um, and it's also an example of where we've taken an issue such as littering or trash on Earth and unsustainable, you know, uh, use of resources. And we've sort of already taken that to space. So could you talk a little bit more about how we've gotten to such a terrible situation with space debris and what is sort of some of the most promising technologies or what are people working on in order to help solve it? Yeah, so space debris was always there, but I guess in the very beginning of the space race, we did not even imagine that we'd have that huge number of satellites being in orbit. Um, no one cared about that in the beginning, and there were no policies to restrict um, such uh, behavior where people can just leave uh, spacecrafts in low Earth orbit and abandon them. Um, I think today there, there's a huge number of, of spacecrafts that are completely abandoned or, or shut down, but are still there, which causes space debris because no one is taking responsibility. So there there are some uh, policies that are being thrown around that maybe every single country should be responsible for the debris that they caused and they should come up with like a vacuum solution where they can clean up the mess that they've made in low earth orbit um we know that today the, the most um destructive uh, method of uh, causing uh, space debris is um, an anti-missiles we've had a uh, Recently this year, I think Russia launched an anti-missile, which, which was going to uh, affect the ISS and astronaut had to evacuate and it was just too dangerous. So the, we are still trying to find a solution for space debris, but I don't think that we, we are close enough to find one. But for now, people are, are just uh, focusing on the law and how the UN COPUS should enforce uh, some restrictions on every single country and how every single country should uh, just prevent causing more debris other than cleaning um, the mess that they've already made. Right, so let's not make the problem worse <laughs> than it already is. Um, there's a really great question from the audience about uh, who should create laws in space? And this is an interesting question because this is a big debate. <laughs> it's been a debate uh, for decades now um, among people who study space law. So from your own opinion, like how, how can we make space more democratic and where should, what's the venue for making more sort of international global laws and regulations around space? Yeah, so I think space should be treated like international waters where um, most countries have a say in what happens and, and what, uh, what doesn't happen. For example, in the UN, you know that we have almost 150 countries that vote on each law, uh, if it works for them or if it doesn't. Um, from my opinion, I think the lawmakers should be the nations. Since we do uh, meet every single year in the UN, we can have votes votes and this is actually how it's been going for a while so no one owns space but we can regulate it through the UN 
Um, thankfully, we have many space lawyers. Uh, the, the major is starting to uh, to become more and more popular with them. You know, the yeah, the education. Yeah, for sure. I've I've met more <laughs> in the last couple of years than I thought I would. Um, this this is a another great question, um, and probably one that's more for us to think about than to answer because I don't know if I have the answer. Um, is a decolonized vision realistic given that the traditional space bearing powers um, and global powers, US, China, Russia, et cetera, are already involved? Um, they won't exactly relinquish their powers, is what this person said. Um, so so what do you what do you think? Are we are we being, you know, blindly hopeful here or is is there actually a path forward? I mean, yeah, that, that's definitely a difficult question because um, we know that it, it is kind of too late. Mm -hmm. Countries are already having their first steps there and we should have had this conversation a long time ago. Um, but I do believe it is possible. There is a possibility. It is very difficult to do that. But if we start now, there, there is a possibility that we you know, at least treat the moon since the moon is the, is, the, is the target, at least treat the moon as just like we, we treat international waters where, you know, vessels uh, and national vessels of certain countries or certain companies are, you know, the, they're just uh, out there and they can operate and do whatever they want, you know. Yeah, and I, I would like to point out that all hope is not necessarily lost. I think there is a lot of people working on this question and who are very dedicated to trying to create systems and norms that will prevent us from carrying over a lot of the colonization that we've seen on Earth to the moon specifically. And I think personally, one of the biggest things we need to do is sort of release some of these really strict regulations we have around allowing countries to work together. And hopefully our, the Artemis Accords is, is a step towards that. But also space is a very capital capital heavy industry. Um, you need a lot of money for the most part to be able to do it. However, we've been seeing that change over time, right? It's getting cheaper. It's still pretty expensive, but it is getting cheaper. So I think bigger countries investing in smaller countries um, space programs and helping them and offering to allow them to use their space ports or their launch vehicles. I think that's the direction we need to go and I'd love to see to see more of that and I know there are a lot of people um, who are working on that and who want to do that. So for me personally, hope is not lost yet. I think we still have a lot to hope for. And what is it in Star Wars? They say, um, Hope was it? Hope is all you need, or something like that. There's, <laughs> I haven't seen the movie in a while, so I forgot the quote. But um, but we only have a couple of minutes left, so there's another question that I think is really interesting, and it goes back to to what we discussed previously about um, space debris. Um, how do you think countries can be held accountable for the damage they've already caused in space? So, for example the US, how, if we have like a specific number of um, satellites that are, orbit, are in lower Earth orbit that are no longer working, how can we make sure that, okay, the US, you need to clean up your, your satellites that aren't working anymore? Is there a mechanism for that currently, or do we need to create one? Oh, we, we, de we definitely need to create one. Um, I know that there are some conversations um, that focus on uh, each country developing their own technology which would clean space debris uh, again the space vacuum um, technology which is uh, many many companies are trying to solve this issue and i also recall that during the un COP, some countries were like okay since we have space debris and the and the issue is not solved yet uh, each country can pay a fee for the damage that they've done I'm not sure if that that's very helpful because either way we we really do need to develop a, a technology that would uh, help us when when it comes to space debris because you know again mega constellations are are about to happen and we're gonna have uh, Starlink is aiming to have uh, forty two thousand uh, satellites in low Earth orbit so how can we save uh, save low Earth orbit from that you know mm. yeah. and what role do you think 
these companies themselves should be playing in, you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about the countries, um, but, you know, there's a lot of private actors in this space now more than ever before, and they're, they're given more, um, their ability to go into space more now is beyond what we could have imagined uh, just a couple of years ago. And you mentioned uh, SpaceX. So how much responsibility do you think should actually fall on the companies to also step up and make sure that they're not making the situation worse? Um, they definitely should be treated just like um, the countries because, you know, uh, SpaceX now is as big as a country. If, you, if we're looking at space activity, they have many launches. Uh, they've contributed to the space sector like in a, in a very big and vital way. So if countries are being held responsible, I'm pretty sure that companies should be held responsible as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, almost like with mining practices on Earth or anything like that, there should be some regulation, regulatory practices there. and and um, sort of reviews done by governments. So I would agree too. Um, as an engineer, I think you might appreciate this next question. Um, how can we ensure the future of space is open source? Oh, or can we? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, space agencies should uh, share the, all the data that they have and make it open source. <laughs> um, we, that, that would be very helpful because, you know, we know that there are many satellites out there. We could really use the data that they have, and they're mainly like um, they're mainly operated by sp big space agencies and big governments. So we do need uh, we do need it to be open source. Um, I believe that many many people are trying to do that, um, especially in the IAC. Like next year, we are going to talk about how can we make space open source and, and just available for everyone? How can we make data uh, unlimited, you know? Yeah, and I think NASA does an okay job at some of that. They do publish a lot of the data behind their research um, on their website or through NASA's huge, so multiple websites. But yeah, I agree with you. I think there definitely needs to be more information sharing and you know, citizen scientists are where we've come up with some of some of the best solutions to some of the, the greatest issues, right? So the more information they have, the more solutions they can create. So I completely agree with that. We only have about a minute and a half left. And there's a question that I just have to get to because it is uh, a huge debate within the space nerd community. Um, which is better, Star Trek or Star Wars? <laughs> Uh, it has to be Star Wars. It's a no-brainer. I, I wonder actually if can't wait to watch the, Yeah, I can't wait to watch the uh, Obi Wan Kenobi series. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been think? waiting for that. Um, well, Lama, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. And is there any last parting thought you would like to leave the rights community, rights con community, with? Um, yeah, I, I would love for people to read more about space and how it contributes to the SDGs since they, uh, they are vital when it comes to human rights. We know that space um, is mostly seen as this far-fetched, um, very technical field, but it is participating heavily in human rights and it is saving our environment. So countries investing in space is uh, something important and yeah I, I believe people should read more about space and how it's helping us on earth and how it's um, helping humans gain their rights. Yes and I will just once again mention this incredible TED talk by Dr. Danielle Wood where she she talks just about that so so thank you so much Lama it's been such a pleasure. Thank you Victoria thank you that was great. <laughs> And that's a wrap. Thanks as always for tuning in and we'll see you in the studio soon.